Now, you can think of planes in a crystal in different ways. So here's the same collection of atoms, but you can think of these as horizontal planes. But if you look at the atoms in a different way, you can think of them as these oblique planes. They're all valid. And what it means is, as you rotate the crystal, you will get this Bragg equation uh, to be um, true for specific angles depending on how you rotate the crystal. So that was the idea. And what Bragg then did was to start looking at very simple objects. And the first object he looked at was common salt, which is sodium chloride. And when he looked at the diffraction pattern, it could only be explained if he thought of salt as an alternate, alternative, a sort of alternate checkerboard arrangement of sodium and chloride ions. Okay. Now here was this guy, he was a graduate student in physics, and chemists had already figured out that sodium chloride, salt was sodium chloride, so it, it has to have a molecule with one atom of sodium and one atom of chlor chlorine. And they didn't like this young physics graduate student telling them that, no, no, actually sodium chloride is this ar arrangement of sodium and chloride ions, and there's no such molecule as sodium chloride. You know, it's just a collection of uh, alternating sodium and chloride ions. And there was a scathing letter from a professor of chemistry at University College uh, to Nature saying, you know, that the, this, this guy is talking complete nonsense and it's not chemical cricket, which is, those of you who are English will know is the ultimate insult. <laughs> so, nevertheless, it turns out that Bragg was correct and he went on to investigate a lot of simple molecules. Now the way that was done is he would shoot his beam of x-rays, look at the diffraction pattern, guess at a structure, and then see if this structure was actually like, you know, predicted the correct diffraction pattern. Now, if your molecule got complicated, that was not an easy way uh, to, to do it. So a way that was thought of was to do, in a, by calculations, what a lens actually does. So this is, on the left is a figure where I showed you that the lens basically takes the scattered rays and recombines them to an image. What you can do is you can measure the scattered rays from a crystal and then mathematically recombine them doing exactly what a lens would do and then form an image of the object uh, computationally, okay? Now, there's a problem which I'm not going to discuss in great detail, and that is when you measure uh, these spots, you're measuring whether the spot is very dark or not so dark, etc. What that tells you is the height of the wave of the x-rays. So it tells you this amplitude, f. So if the amplitude is large, then you know it'll be a very dark spot, okay, a very intense spot. What it doesn't tell you is how those spots are related to each other, which is, which is to say, how much does the crest of one spot lag behind or go ahead of the crest of a neighboring spot? You, don't, you have no idea of that. And there were clever methods uh, to determine what is called the phase of each spot, okay, or each reflection, which is to say how much it lagged behind or, uh, or, or was ahead of a reference spot. But once you knew the relative relationship of each of the spots uh, in terms of where their crests were relative to all the other spots, you could then uh, do what is called a Fourier summation by mathematicians. And that's essentially doing what a lens is doing uh, in real space and get back an image of the molecule. So using this sort of thing, uh, Dorothy Hodgkin uh, is somebody who pushed this technique uh, to tremendous limits. And uh, she's one of the few scientists to be on two postage stamps, uh, two separate occasions when she was on a postage stamp. And here is seen the structure of penicillin. And penicillin, like sodium chloride, was also the subject of an argument. When she got the structure, many chemists didn't think that you could have this square beta lactam ring because they thought it would be too strained, but it turns out it is uh, absolutely correct. And then 
she went on to determine a very large molecule called vitamin B12, which has a cobalt ion in the middle. And this was a real tour de force of the kinds of methods she was using uh, to determine structures. Now, what about if you have much larger structures? For example, uh, vitamin B12 has a few hundred atoms, and that was considered amazingly difficult. But um, when you go to proteins, which are large macromolecules, actually, you know, you might consider just stopping because I haven't changed very much in the last few minutes, okay? So uh, it, it, the noise is a little distracting, okay? So um, if you want to go to uh, much larger structures, you needed a different method. And that method was uh, first developed by Max Perutz and John Kendrew, who founded the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, where I work. And here it is, here they're shown, this picture was available on eBay, and John Kendrew was referred to as Paul C. Kendrew for $27.88, you could buy this photograph. But anyway, they're shown at the Nobel uh, occasion, and you can see that's Gisela, or Gisela Perutz, who's uh, Max's wife, uh, in between them. They solved the structures of hemoglobin and myoglobin by using the fact that if you can take a crystal and put a, a heavy atom in it, like gold or mercury, and then collect the data with and without the heavy atom, you can then determine that phase relationship uh, between the uh, various waves, and then you can solve its structure. So that's how many uh, structures, uh, both small proteins all the way to enormous uh, uh, molecules have been solved uh, for the last 50 years or so. M Max and uh, John solved their structure in the sort of around 1962. And so since then, that technique has been the main method. There is another way to determine molecular structure, and that is by NMR. But NMR is not a visualization technique. Rather, what it does is it measures distances between different atoms along a chain, and then it figures out how the chain can be folded because only a certain fold will be in agreement with all those uh, distances. It's not a visualization uh, technique like uh, crystallography. But the problem with crystallography is that, um, first of all, you need large amounts of material. Uh, you need it to be relatively pure. It often takes years to get crystals. So people will work away, and until they have crystals, they have absolutely nothing. Uh, to show for their work. But the reason people try it is because when everything works, uh, an atomic structure is possible. And when you have an atomic structure, you can really start to understand uh, how it works. I mean, it, you know, you just have to think of the structure of DNA, for example. You know, before knowing the structure, you didn't have no clue how, you know, this molecule c could carry information. And suddenly with the structure uh, made it visually very, uh, you know, you could see instantly how it might work. Now, there's another technique that has been around for quite a long time, which is electron microscopy. And much less material uh, is required, and you also don't need any crystals. But, and you can work with samples that aren't particularly pure, but in the past, you couldn't get to the level of detail of visualization to build an atomic model. So you would get what we would call blobology. You'd get, you'd get a sort of structure, but it'd be very sort of diffuse and blobby, and you couldn't get an atomic structure from uh, that sort of technique. Now, electron microscopy has been around for a long time. It was actually first invented in 1933 uh, by Ernst Ruska, but soon after that, you know, just when it became obvious that it was uh, uh, going to be very useful, uh, World War II broke out, and I suppose after the war, people simply forgot about him until uh, they must have woken up at some point and awarded him the Nobel Prize uh, 53 years after he made his discovery. It's lucky that he was, had sufficient longevity. You know, you can see he died just two years after the Nobel Prize. And this shows you one of his early microscopes. Now, the way that uh, you can 
make 3D uh, structures, get a 3D image of a molecule from the electron microscope was worked out by people like Aaron Klug. Uh, and here's a famous uh, paper from De Rosier and Klug where what they showed was that when you take an image under an electron microscope, you're essentially getting a two-dimensional projection of the object. But if you were to take different views of the object, then you would get different two-dimensional projections. And by combining these two-dimensional projections, you could reconstruct the three-dimensional image of the object. Now, this is exactly the principle in a CAT scan. You know, if you go to uh, have a CAT scan taken, what you do is you go, you sit there, and there are X-ray cameras that go all around you and take X-ray pictures of different sections of you. And then these sections are combined in the computer to form a three-dimensional image of your insides. And it's essentially the same uh, principle, and uh, it is like tomography. But in order to get to high resolution, two other things had to be, uh, become possible. One is that in order to get high resolution, you need lots of data. Because if you just try to collect all your information from a single molecule and simply tilted it to get all the views, you would essentially destroy your molecule because electrons are highly uh, damaging to, to biological material. So what you want is to collect weak data but from lots and lots of molecules. And the way that's done nowadays is a technique called cryo-electron microscopy. Cryo meaning cold. Because what you do is you take your molecules in solution and you take a thin layer of that solution and very rapidly cool it. When you rapidly cool it you know, to liquid nitrogen temperatures, you cool it so fast that it cannot form crystalline ice. So it forms something called vitreous or glassy ice. And now you collect your images and what you do is you have two-dimensional projections uh, of all these different uh, views of the object because this object is Different molecules are in different orientations. They're randomly oriented from one to the next. And there, there are clever ways of figuring out which orientation of this object gave rise to this projection and this projection and this one. So you can match each projection to a particular orientation of the object. And then you can recombine them just as Aaron Klug had done by tilting the, the molecule. And that way you could get uh, images of the three-dimensional images of any object that you could look at under the electron microscope. But of course, this gave rise to only fairly blobby images. But what has happened uh, recently is that there have been much better uh, detectors for electrons. So these are called direct electron detectors. So those have uh, allow you to get much better signal, and the detectors are also so fast that another thing that happens is when electrons hit the object, the object gets charged and starts moving around. And so this then allows you to compensate for the movement because they collect the images very fast. And then you have better image processing uh, to do that. So what has happened is in the last three or four years, uh, there's been a tremendous revolution uh, in uh, cryo-electron microscopy. And for the first time in almost 100 years, we have an alternative to crystallography uh, to get atomic structures of large molecules. And one of the uh, big advances was made uh, by Richard Henderson and Wazi Faruqi, who are my colleagues at the LMB. Now, for the rest of the talk, I want to talk to you about a very large molecule that I'm interested in. Uh, which is involved in translating genes into proteins. Now, here is you know, a cartoon of DNA. It's not very realistic, but uh, it is a double helix. Uh, so let's just take it for, for that. Now, what happens is that DNA, the genetic po gene part of DNA gets copied into a single-stranded molecule called messenger RNA, which you know, biochemically resembles DNA in that it's also nucleic acid, and it's a linkage of sugar, phosphate, and base, and it has four types of bases. Now, the information uh, here is in the form of a code. Uh, so 
It's the sequence of these building blocks of DNA or RNA that specifies the sequence of amino acids uh, that make up the code. But whereas there are about, there are four types of bases here, there are at least 20 types of amino acids. And so the way to go from the code on the gene, from the genetic code, to build uh, this, this chain of amino acids that makes up a protein is by reading these bases three at a time. So the code is known to be a triplet code, and each group of three bases specifies one of the 20 amino acids. And the way that's done is that um, a particular molecule called a tRNA molecule actually reads off three of the bases here by interacting at one end and, builds and brings along an appropriate amino acid that corresponds to that three-letter code. And there's another tRNA molecule that might read the next uh, group of three bases that brings in a different amino acid, and that's how things are linked up. Now, this doesn't happen just spontaneously. It turns out that it, cell biologists who are looking to see where uh, proteins are made inside cells found that they're actually made in these sort of blobs on the endoplasmic reticulum. And people isolated these blobs, and what you can see is that each blob uh, consists of two subunits or two parts, each subunit, uh, and, and they're all about 250 angstroms in diameter. Now, it turns out these particles, when they were isolated, were shown to consist of both protein and RNA. And uh, so they were called ribonucleoproteins, and th they were isolated from what were called the microsomes or the microsomal fraction. But uh, this was quite a long way to describe uh, a particle. So at some point, it was decided to call it the ribosome. Uh, and of course, if biochemists had first discovered it instead of cell biologists, they might have called it, you know, protein polymerase or polypeptide polymerase. They would have given it a completely different name. But because cell biologists discovered it first, they give it a name like a some, uh, endosome or lysosome, so they called it the ribosome. Now, the way that the ribosome works is that there are two halves, and one, the one subunit, called the small subunit, binds uh, the genetic material, which is the messenger RNA. And the ribosome has slots. It has three slots for those tRNA molecules. And at the beginning, the first tRNA binds at the starting a triplet codon. So the signal starts here. The ribosome has ways to figure out that and it brings along the first amino acid. And then the ribosome selects the right tRNA that corresponds to the next triplet. And then that tRNA brings along its amino acid, and then the ribosome catalyzes a bond between the first and second amino acid. And then the whole thing has to move, and after it moves, it's kicked out the original tRNA, and now it's ready to get the next tRNA, and then the next tRNA comes in, brings along amino acid three, and then uh, the ribosome forms a bond between two and three. So what you've seen in this short uh, series of animations is that the ribosome is reading along the gene, you know, and choosing the right tRNAs that, so that they bring along the right amino acids to form a protein chain in which the amino acids are selected in just the right order and, and stitched together, okay? Now, if you actually looked at what a ribosome looked like, this is an electron microscopy picture uh, from the mid-90s. You, you can see a lot of structure, but you couldn't see an atomic structure from this because there isn't enough detail. But you can see that the tRNAs are actually these L-shaped molecules and the nascent, the growing protein chain comes out of a tunnel in the ribosome. And the, mRNA isn't straight, but it's actually wrapped around the neck of the small subunit. Now, that's where we were in the mid-90s, and it didn't seem at the time that electron microscopy would get much better, uh, although now we know uh, that it is possible. So if we had to do it all over again, we wouldn't have done it using crystallography. But in the mid-90s, you know, the 
to get an atomic structure, you had to try and solve its uh, crystal structure. And uh, crystals were obtained by Ada Yonat initially in 1980, but the field had gone on for about 15 years and there was no progress towards getting a high resolution structure. And then really the field started taking off when a number of other groups, including Peter Moore and Tom Stites at Yale University and then we initially in Utah and then in Cambridge uh, started working on the problem. And there was a group in uh, Santa Cruz which was working on, by Harry Noller and his colleagues, which was working on the structure of the whole ribosome. Now, the way this is done is you take crystals and, and it's, of course, it's difficult to grow crystals of a large molecule. The, the ribosome consists of half a million atoms, so it's not like sodium chloride, which has only two atoms. And so when you have a large molecule like that, to get it to form regular crystals can often uh, be a real challenge. But once you have crystals, you uh, take your crystal and then hit it with a beam of x-rays, and then you collect the data uh, you know, uh, using an electronic detector. And because the ribosome is such a large molecule, there are not enough ribosomes even in a decent sized crystal. First of all, you can't get these crystals to grow very large, but there are, you know, there are not enough what are called unit cells, enough repeats uh, in, a, in a, a typical crystal. So the, the spots are very weak, and that means you need very, very powerful sources of x-rays. And what we typically have to do is go to these uh, large accelerators, these electron accelerators, which are called synchrotrons, which are extremely powerful sources of x-rays. And I often joke, because we've used uh, r synchrotrons in near New York and Grenoble and France and Chicago and uh, the Swiss light source that you could join a ribosome lab and see the world, but because the U.S. Navy used to say, you know, join the U.S. Navy and see the world. Well, of course, they were, they were lying to you because you didn't see the world at all. You saw the inside of some horrible ship. And uh, so, you know, my people actually only see the inside of the world synchrotrons. And what they actually see, they, they, they don't, you know, hardly, I don't think they ever went skiing once in Grenoble. So uh, what they see is something that looks like that. This is a... a beamline at the ESRF in Grenoble. And uh, this is, you know, this thing keeps the crystals cold, the crystals over here, and this is a very large detector. And the beam comes in from that direction, hits the crystals, and then goes off to this detector. Now, once you <coughs> have done the experiment and it, it's worked, what you get is a three-dimensional image of the object. But it's not telling you the atomic structure. What you're seeing is something that looks like this, okay? And the question is, how do you go from this to an atomic structure? Well, it's a little bit like solving a jigsaw puzzle, okay? You have to recognize shapes and so on. But there are some interesting differences between this and a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and that is, first of all, this is in three dimensions and not in two dimensions. Secondly, this is a real experiment, so it has errors in it. And the errors can be two types. One is you're seeing things that look like image, which are actually noise. They shouldn't be part of the image at all. And so you'll be trying to fit things in that, but you really shouldn't be. And another is that there are parts of the image that are missing, partly because of errors or partly because that part of the molecule is not fixed, but it's moving around and it's sort of blurred. So um, it's a complicated thing. But, but the most important difference, of course, is that you're not given the answer on the cover of the box, okay? So you don't actually know what the uh, answer should be uh, when you start. But the method is pretty much the same, and that is you basically look for regions uh, that look very similar, and um, you, you say, okay, uh, here I have a, a region which looks like uh, I see a strand here and another strand here, and they're connected somehow uh, by a series of bridges. And so if you know, and also you can see some regular bumps. There's a, there's a bump here, a bump here, a bump here. So they're regular features that are repeating along these strands. So if you know what you're doing, 
then you immediately recognize this is a double-stranded piece of RNA. So it's exactly like DNA has a double helix. <coughs> RNA can also form double helices. And so you suddenly, what you've done is you've interpreted the three-dimensional image in atomic terms, in chemical terms. And so now you've taken a piece of the image and interpreted it as an atomic structure. And what you have to do is then repeat that throughout your image until you have no more image to explain in terms of atomic structure. And at that point, you've effectively built an atomic structure from your three-dimensional image. <clears throat> so using exactly this, um, the atomic structures of both the small and large subunits of the ribosome was solved, uh, were solved in 2000. And what these structures did was they, solve, they helped solve an old conundrum, which is, you know, the ribosome consists of both protein and RNA. But the ribosome itself is the machine that makes proteins using instructions that are encoded in our genes. So if the ribosome is used to make proteins, it itself consists of proteins, how could the ribosome even have evolved, you know? Because where did the proteins that make up the ribosome even come from? Well, the first person to uh, address this was Francis Crick. And he suggested that maybe early ribosomes consisted only of RNA. At the time, there was no evidence that RNA could actually carry out chemical reactions. But subsequently, about 20 years after Crick proposed it, uh, Czech and Altman discovered that RNA could, like protein enzymes, could also carry out chemical reactions. So suddenly, RNA was a molecule that could not only carry genetic information, like DNA, but it could also carry, carry out chemical reactions, like proteins. So RNA could do the work of both DNA and proteins. And biologists now believe that the early world evolved from a, a, a substantially RNA world in which RNA carried out reactions, perhaps with the help of small peptides, but also became self-replicating and became, uh, you know, carry, and thereby carried genetic information. And the thing that came out of these structures is if you looked at the key parts of the ribosome, they consisted only of RNA. Those were not the parts where the ribosomal proteins were. And the, so it lent uh, s support to the idea of Crick's, which actually people like Harry Noller produced a lot of uh, evidence for, that the ribosome was really an RNA-based machine and may have emerged from an early RNA world. And then the ribosomal proteins got added on later to make the machine more efficient. Now, a few years later, we solved the structure of the entire ribosome with the tRNAs and mRNA bound, about a year after Jamie Kate had solved the structure of an empty uh, whole ribosome. And so this sort of paved the way for understanding how the ribosome works. And over the years, we've taken snapshots of the ribosome in different stages of the process to try to understand how it works. And I'll show you a movie about that later. Now, another important aspect of the ribosome is antibiotics. You know, as many of you know, there's a huge crisis in antibiotics, and it's been the subject of many popular articles. This is a, a whole issue of the, a, a large portion of this issue of The Economist was devoted to the rise of antibiotic resistance. Now, it turns out that many antibiotics, a substantial fraction of known antibiotics, act by blocking the ribosome. So they bind to different parts of the ribosome and interfere with different parts of ribosome function. And uh, once you know the atomic structure, what you can do is you can take your crystals, soak in an antibiotic, and then recollect the data, and then look at the difference between the structure with the antibiotic and the structure without. And what that tells you is, what that gives you is an image of the antibiotic itself. And so you can then place the antibiotic in the context of the ribosome structure. And using exactly that, we were able to determine the structure of many uh, different antibiotics bound to the small subunit, uh, whereas other people like Tom Stites and 
uh, Jamie Cade and his colleagues and Ada Yonat uh, did structures of antibiotics bound to the large subunit. Now, drug companies were obviously interested in trying to use these structures to design better antibiotics. And in fact, one such company, which used to be called Ribex, uh, was founded by Tom Stites, who uh, solved the structure of the 50S subunit along with his uh, colleagues at Yale. And what Ribex uh, had was an interesting idea. So what is shown here on the left are two natural antibiotics that bind to the 50S subunit. This one is called chloramphenicol, and this one is called erythromycin. Now, the problem is, the problem with chloramphenicol is it's highly toxic, okay? It's a good antibiotic, but it's highly toxic. I mean, it has side effects. And so it's not often used. In fact, I may be one of the few people in this room who's had chloramphenicol because it used to be used to treat typhoid, okay? Now, on the other hand, erythromycin is a very uh, safe antibiotic. It has very few side effects. But the problem is a number of strains of bacteria have res acquired resistance to these uh, class of antibiotics called macrolides, like erythromycin. And so the red shows that they're resistant. And so you can see there are many strains of antibiotics that are resistant. So the question is, what Ribex thought was, what if we were to make a, a molecule, a compound, that would simply link both of these two antibiotics? Then we would have something that would bind to both pockets at once. So if you have resistance to one pocket, it would still work. And because you have a very much larger molecule, the chances it would bind somewhere else and be toxic would also not be great, okay? And so uh, they went ahead and uh, made a, mo a comp compound, which is shown in blue, which they gave some code name, RX2102. And then they verified that it indeed bound exactly, sometimes you can design a molecule and think it'll bind in a certain way, but it doesn't, you know, for various reasons. But this actually bound uh, exactly as they had predicted it would bind. And Lo and behold, it was actually uh, effective against all of those resistant uh, strains of bacteria. So you have a very promising compound, but of course, having a promising compound is not the same as having a drug because a compound has to be easy to, relatively cheap to make. It has to have, have no toxic side effects. It has to be, you have to be able to absorb it. You know, bacteria have to be able to, it has to be able to enter the bacteria. So there are all kinds of issues in going from something that works on ribosomes in a, in a test tube to actually being a drug, okay? And, but nevertheless, the company had a number of promising lead compounds, and some of them had entered uh, clinical trials. Now, at this point, a few years ago, it tried to launch an IPO, okay? It had gone through several rounds of uh, VC or venture capitalist funding, and they figured, okay, we've now made the technical advances, time to launch an IPO. And when it tried to launch an IPO, it found that the share price it could command was only a small fraction of what the investors had already put into it, okay? And so they withdrew the IPO, and then the company was eventually bought and is now known as Melenta. And luckily, the person who bought it is not simply stripping off the assets, but rather is investing in the company so it's still you know, he wants to make a, a, a go of it. But at the same time, within a month of this attempted IPO, there was an IPO of a Californian company whose main product is the ability to exchange gossip and photographs and so on. And it's worth many billions of dollars, okay? And so I, I can tell you that you know, I, have, I don't worry about dying because I don't have a Facebook account, okay? <laughs> but, but, you know, this is the world we live in. And uh, so the, the real problem is that antibiotic development has a pr failure in, in the market. And that is, there's a reason for that. If you develop a new antibiotic, 
then you don't want resistance to develop against the new antibiotic. It's very expensive. It costs over a billion dollars to go from research to a working drug. And so if you develop a, a new antibiotic, you want to restrict its use to those patients who cannot be treated by available antibiotics. And so this means your patient pool is very small, so your profits are going to be small. So the other problem is if you have an antibiotic and it actually is effective, the patient takes it for about a week and is cured. So they're not a lifelong customer. It's not like taking a statin or, you know, diabetic drug or, or um, you know, antihypertensive or, you know, whatever. So, so, you know, this is not the ideal for making a lot of money. And also a lot of infectious diseases are in developing countries which can't really afford you know, very expensive drugs, you know, so if you bumped up the cost, you know, to compensate, you wouldn't be able to recover it. So it's clear that, you know, other models are required uh, to develop antibiotics. And, you know, you may know that the UK government commissioned a study on the AMR, and there's a report by uh, Jim, o headed by Jim O'Neill. And one of their ideas is that you have uh, what's called a challenge prize, so you, you have a company that, are you finished or? <laughs> yes, I think it'd be a good idea. Okay, thanks. So uh, you, you, you have a challenge where you offered companies a prize, like a billion dollars, if they bring a brand new antibiotic to market, okay? So this would be sort of paying them, you know, after the fact. And so, um, I think that's one possibility, but we mustn't forget that the first antibiotic, penicillin, wasn't really developed by a company at all. It was developed by the British government in response to uh, World War II, and people died, more soldiers were dying of infection uh, than of bullets. So the only th thing that you can guarantee is if you develop a new drug, you will get resistance, and th the reason is Antibiotics or any drug works by a tight fit between the drug and its target in the cell. There's a pocket in the cell to which it binds, and that's how all drugs essentially work. And, you know, so if there's a pocket in the ribosome, the antibiotic binds there and it blocks the ribosome. Now you can destroy that fit in a number of ways. One is you could break down the antibiotics into little pieces, so each piece won't be a tight fit anymore in the, in the pocket. And this is how penicillin resistance often works. Another co common strategy is the cell has enzymes that will add extra groups to the antibiotics. So now the antibiotic, the shape of the antibiotic will be different and it won't fit in the pocket properly. A third way is to modify the pocket itself. That's due to mutations. Uh, so you change the nature of the pocket and that way the pocket shape has changed and so the drug doesn't work properly. And finally, cells also have these, what are called efflux pumps. These are channels in the membrane uh, of the bacterium which pump out compounds uh, from the inside of the cell to the outside. And quite by, uh, either by accident or by evolution, they pump out antibiotics. And so if the cell has these pumps that it can be turned on, they can uh, pump it out. But the the fact is you will always get resistance. It's a, but how it occurs may be different, but it, you will get resistance. And so that's why it's very important to have a, a, a multi-pronged approach to the problem of antibiotic resistance. You know, you need to promote rational use. So for instance, you shouldn't be taking antibiotics for the flu or for the common cold, you know. So that's, the, Britain is very good about that. The NHS now is very strict about when it uh, gives antibiotics. But other countries are not so strict. And in many countries, you can buy antibiotics without a prescription. Uh, another uh, bad use of antibiotics is people found out by accident that uh, if you give antibiotics to cattle, they gain weight. And so it's now used in agriculture to fatten up uh, animals. And this is a terrible use of antibiotics and ought, ought to be you know, discontinued. You can have better surveillance, you can have better infection control, even a simple procedure like washing your hands before you enter a ward has brought down uh, infections in the NHS uh, considerably. 
And then finally, where scientists can help are a number of ways. One is to understand how bacteria cause disease, and they, that'll tell you what the weak points of the bacterium are. Uh, you can have better diagnostics so that when somebody comes with an infection, you can immediately test what infection they have, which bacterium, and then uh, prescribe an appropriate uh, treatment for it. You could have vaccine development, which you know, prevents the problem in the first place. And of course, a lot of it is, uh, about, can be about new drugs of the kind uh, of work that I told you about. So I want to close by showing you a little movie of the ribosome to show you what it really looks like, I mean, more realistically looks like than this, those little cartoons I showed you. So this is just to So this is just showing you the long genetic message. And there you see the small subunit of the ribosome. And it has to figure out where to start. And it starts with the help of three protein factors. And in blue is shown that first tRNA that has brought in the first amino acid. And then the large subunit joins. And these factors leave. And so then what happens is at some point, the ribosome is ready to start adding new amino acids to the growing uh, polypeptide chain. And so uh, the new tRNAs are brought in by another protein called EFTU. And if it's the correct tRNA, it lets go, and the tRNA then joins inside the peptidyl transferase center, and then the two amino acids are linked together in the pocket in the large subunit. And then you get movement first with respect to the large subunit and then with respect to the small subunit with the help of another factor called EFG. And so this kind of procedure, and then now you can have another tRNA coming in and you know doing that. Now, what will happen is the tRNAs have to come in and go through the ribosome. And this shows you how protein uh, synthesis actually works. So tRNA are coming into the ribosome and moving through and leaving at the other end, and all the while adding amino acids to the growing polypeptide chain in the ribosome. And the, the chain then emerges through a tunnel in the ribosome and then folds up, because proteins fold up into characteristic shapes. Uh, and the shape is sort of the information on what that shape is is built into the sequence of the amino acids in the protein. Finally, when it comes to the end, a special protein cleaves off the newly made protein from the ribosome, and it goes off and does its thing. And then a special factor called recycling factor comes in and splits the ribosome apart, and uh, the whole process can start over again. And just while you've been listening to this talk, uh, thousands of and upon thousands of ribosomes, both in your own cells and in your, and the bacteria that are in your body. There are more bacteria in you than there are you in you. And so, uh, so all of them have been making, you know, thousands and thousands of proteins as we speak. So thank you very much.